So I'm going to tell you about um, our effort in making data, cloud, and AI all happen in parallel and uh, in the healthcare industry. Um, so as you just heard from uh, MD Anderson, you know, data is a huge challenge, right? So to, to how to process data and then how to, in the same uh, realm, uh, build a computer infrastructure and also uh, moving into deep learning is going to be sort of the focus of my talk. But then I'll introduce you to uh, the architecture we put behind this. So you can actually build this for yourself, right? Both in your hospital or research institution, but also in the cloud. And also we're going to show you uh, eight different use cases maps to the benefits you'll get for the, f uh, the, uh, the four benefits I'll, uh, I'll describe. And then once you finish, you can go to our uh, station right here. It's uh, number 11. We actually have real demo running where you can actually search uh, and put your hands on some of the, uh, the use case. Um, so let me get started here. Um, so lots of patients and lots of uh, challenge in terms of you know, cancers and 18 million, uh, 1.8 million new patients every year. Um, all the data we talked about from clinical imaging, genomics, and, and uh, real-world evidence. For example, we're collecting ECG data, video data, uh, you know, wearable sensor data, continuous ob observation that Chuck talked about. Um, and then how do we turn all these data into insights is really sort of my focus here. Um, and then help each one and every one of you who are the expertise in tackling these problems and finding insights right, to build the infrastructure um, but then how do we do this in a way that is repeatable and reusable? So, so I'm going to focus on this little box here in what we call the high-performance data and AI architecture. So this is really the architecture, architecture uh, we put together in collaboration, for example, with MD Anderson Cancer Center with the Qatar Genome Project. Uh, you also heard early today with the New York Genome. Um, so this is not just a chart. This is actually what's driving all our projects or our innovation. Um, so let me show you what, uh, what it is. But before I go there, let me just explain what they are I mean, the benefits to you, right? So high performance, so fast time to results, right? If you think sequencing one genome uh, and finishing an analysis in a week is fast, how about a day? What if it's one hour, right? What if one day it's going to be real time? So this is what we're pushing for. And also for, we're doing the same for imaging ana analytics, analytics and, and deep learning. Um, low cost, so we heard it from the last you know, presentation, how do we control the cost? How do we lower your bill? Even you go to cloud, can, can we use the same architecture to help you lower the cost? Ease of use, single button click. Um, I can actually run a full genome analysis pipeline on an iPad in your hand here in the booth. Right? You can actually learn how to do deep learning on a single click button platform we're working together with Washington University Radiology Department. So they're going to do a demo here on Thursday. Um, and collaborative. So we're seeing the, um, uh, the trend for what I call the parallel discovery. So someone generates data. Someone analyzes the model, generate the model. They work together to analyze the data and then apply the application on a global scale. Right? So all this architecture has to be collaborative and extensible from on-premise to the cloud. So what is it? What, how does it look like? So the first thing we want to address is data, right? So Chuck talked about um, the challenge of data. So the way I sort of interpret this is almost like a pyramid. So data coming from all these instruments down there, sequencer, scanner, um, they get processed, right, using high-performance computing. This could be, you know, a high-performance computing system gets down, um, reduced, eventually turns into them into variants, right? You know, every human has about, roughly speaking, two to three million variants. And then the variance uh, is analyzed again into actionable information and insights. Uh, so we, we call these biomarkers. In the, in the case for clinical treatment, you can actually pass them to genetic counsel, right, to make gen uh, clinical reports. So this whole process generates tons of data, right? And also you can actually look at the curve here and the distribution of the data. Um, but on the reverse of this is the complexity of the application, right? So you have application that process data, analyze data, and eventually interpret data. So the complexity actually goes to the, rever the, the reverse of the data. So data gets reduced and simplified, yet the application becomes more complex. And even not only complex, they become, they turn into workflow, right? They turn into a very sort of matrix-like uh, structure where you, you have to pass data around into like a, a matrix of applications, so which I show on the right. That's a, one of the famous 
uh, GATK pipeline for genomic uh, data processing uh, from Broad Institute. Um, so that's just genomics. What if it's imaging, right? So you, here you look at three of the world's most advanced imaging platform. One is Creo EM, so that does all the you know, uh, high throughput ele electronic uh, microscope, uh, and then PET scanner, and also high content screening. Each one of these generates terabytes of data per, per hour. So they, they comes in here as raw data that gets analyzed, reduced. By the way, this is a tau protein just got resolved by Creo EM for uh, Alzheimer's disease. Right? And then you apply the deep learning and training to the data, and then you can generate a model where you can predict, right? like uh, Eric Schmidt talked about yesterday at the kickoff. Right? So th imaging itself is now becoming a high-performance data challenge. Uh, and the reverse of that is application like, how many of you here actually use imaging analytics? No? You know, run application like you know, Creo, uh, not only Creo EM, but FreeSurfer, um, which uh, pre-processing imaging data. But now you also see right, deep learning and, and AI fused into this field right, for imaging and uh, imaging analytics. So here's the architecture. So we, when I talk about genomics, imaging, and I even touched on clinical and real world evidence. So each one of these is a pillar in our healthcare industry that is driving data comp computation and deep learning. So how can we not build one platform or one system or one box for one application, but Build something that you can use across all these, right? And also allow you to collaborate and also allow you to scale. Um, so we already made this happen four years ago with MD Anderson Cancer Center, right? And we're now introducing this to the whole world. And the architecture is open. I actually wrote a book for this. You can Google genomics architecture. You get a free ebook on this one, right? So just very, at a very high level, there is a, think of this as an operating system for data, AI, and cloud, right? So there's a data layer and there's an orchestration layer. This layer helps you manage all the compute resource. This could be a CPU, GPU, could be a cloud, could be a VM. This helps you manage all the data, like we just talked about uh, uh, at MD Anderson, right? So we can leverage all the infrastructure and resource down there in providing um, what I call the app store for your favorite application. So name your favorite application, right? It could be imaging, it could be genomics, and even more complex, it can be a workflow, right? So we turn them into a infrastructure that essentially we can run everything, everywhere, and anywhere, right? So this is the goal of this architecture, and then we can make it uh, consumable through APIs, through platforms, and I'll show you the eight use case if I have time. Um, so very high level, this is the data hub, right? The data, the blue layer, where we can land data very fast, Tier the data to low cost, like Chuck just talked about, lower the cost. Uh, we can ac provide access to the data whichever way th you want your data to be accessed. Um, you know, NFS, SIFS, protocol, uh, Hadoop, big data, object. This is what, what I call the, the peering of the data to another site, right? So this could be to another cloud. This could be to another system in your institution. And finally, um, the MetOcean project I, we just talked about on the last talk is a data catalog we're building on top of this. So we're going to make data, make this a home for data, no matter where you put them, right? So this can be on-premise, or, or it can be in the cloud. And one of the IBM product, which is also shown in our booth, is called the Spectrum Scale. And there's an appliance for delivering the software called ESS, right? So now, if you send data to uh, M, you know, MD Anderson, or how many of you actually use 23andMe? So your data is going to actually sit on this, right? So it's already happening. It's everywhere. Um, and this is the green layer. This is where you orchestrate the compute layer, right? So if you go to a cloud, you, you subscribe to a bunch of VMs, or if you build a system on-premise, or like in our booth, you have a laptop, we can actually put this green layer on and turn it into this very highly scalable architecture, right? Run the job. We can burst the job into the cloud. We can also turn it into a workflow. Um, so I talk about auto-drive cars. Now we have an auto-drive genomic pipeline. Single button click, we can finish the entire analysis, right? And also we're going to build an app store here, just like we built the, the MetaOcean for data cataloging. Um, so let me talk about the use case. Um, so the first one is speed. How fast can we go? Can we go faster and even faster? Can we be the fastest in the world? And the answer is yes. And we have customers um, like UPMC, they actually have a pathology lab now doing genomic testing. Right, for their patients. We also have Children's Hospital of LA doing the same for their Oncokit panel using exon sequencing. 
So all of them runs on this architecture. You can think of this as a, probably the most simplified version of the architect. Two layers, some server, some disk, and we we'll build it. And it's super fast, right? And we work, and the reason for that is we work with the software provider like Broad, and we optimize the application against the layers and also the servers. So when you deploy this, it's ready to go, right? It's the fastest. So for example, on GATK, um, it used to be you have to you know, you use multiple servers, you finish the full alignment, sequencing, variant call in about two days, and then our competitor now can do it one day. And we just cross a uh, 10 hour on a single server, and we're on the next release with GATK4, we're gonna cross probably six hours. The other exciting development for GATK is it's also going to infuse within it a deep learning module. So you're going to have AI embedded in your application, right? And we're going to use the same architecture to drive that, right? So you, you don't have to buy a separate GPU server to run this application anymore, right? Help you also save cost. Um, on the next use case, we're also delivering uh, low cost, right? So, this, so Chuck talked about what I call the bending the curve, right? So your, if your data is growing like that, can you control it? Right? So we're using technology like tiering the data to low-cost media like tape and cloud. Uh, so last year, City of Hope talked about a very similar approach. Right? So the idea here is if you can move your data to a lower cost tier um, and you can save cost, why don't you do that? And the reason you don't do that is it's very hard to control the data. Right? Because if, if you don't understand your data, like who is using what and what type of data and the temperature of the data in, in, in a sense that the data is very frequently accessed. You probably don't want to put it into the, a very you know, low-performance cloud object store, right? So can we control all of that? And the answer is yes. So we, we have in our blue layer, we're building to the, what we call the metadata control plane. So we can tell you exactly who, when, how the data is being used. And you can use that to do the tiering, right? And this is also deployed at MDNS, and this is WashU Genome Center, so one of the largest genome centers in the US. Use the same technology, and New York Genome, and Qatar Genome Center. So these are some of the largest genomic projects in the world, right, which are taking advantage of this uh, technology. Um, so going beyond this, if you look at the collaboration space, data needs to move around. So data just can't stay in one place because you're sequencing them here. Your data scientist might, might be in Europe, right, in Basel, and one of your collaborators might be in UK, like in Genomics England. So the data actually have to move. In this case, we have built into our blue layer a mechanism to move data, almost like you move data to a Dropbox or you know, uh, 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 or cloud object store. So we can actually help you synchronize the data movements using this technology, right? Essentially creating a, a global namespace for your data. Um, and on the, on the ease of use, um, so let me talk about the genomic pipeline. So here you look at taking uh, 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 raw data Right? And starting from here and going through this very complex workflow. Now imagine you write that in a script, right? It's gonna be thousands of lines, and you're gonna monitor this, probably stay up for long, I mean stay up at night, making sure you can finish your analysis and get your variants. Now we're gonna do this in a single button click. And this is fully automated. It handles errors, it parallelizes the workflows, right? And not only that, if you if you deploy this in a clinical sequencing lab, we're going to give you the full report, like who run the pipeline when, is it successful, what are the data being created. We can even give you more information like all the metadata associated with the pipeline. So now we're changing the concept of computation from a job to a workflow, right? And this is very important because you might go back and say, you know, how did I get that results? How can I rep reproduce that results? So the rep reproducibility of the genomic pipeline or the imaging pipeline is being realized in this uh, use case. And we'll show you the demo in our booth. So let's move into the, the last stage of your data. So once you get the data processed, you get them into a form where you want to access them. So here we're working with uh, the most exciting genomic project in the world, um, Genomics England, to create world's largest genomic database. So in this case, think of, so I mentioned earlier, each human has about 200, 2 million variants. Um, so here you're looking at each one of these variants, right? So here's a mutation happens uh, on the chromosome. We can actually indicate the position. But all these columns are either the phenotypes or 
annotated feature of that mutation, either already discovered or being annotated as we speak or being published. So we're going to annotate all these different data aligned with this variance. And I'm just showing you 10. Now for each human or each patient, there are going to be 2 million going down, probably going down to the Earth, the core of the Earth, right? And that's just one patient. Now we're going to actually develop this database to support probably over a million, maybe a billion. So in our booths, we have a database that has 17 patients. I mean, that's already 34 million rows of these. And what do, you can go there and search for your favorite protein, like TP53, which is one of the most heavily studied oncoprotein, oncogene right now. You can search. You can search for the favorite mutation. And then going beyond that, you can ask the question like, if I find TP53 in my patient, who else has it? So for all these institutions that connected to this network called Beacon Network, it's a data federation technology, um, you can ask the question, who has the same mutation? And all, look at all the green button there. You can actually get the answer immediately back. Like, who has this mutation? Can they share with me? Right? So this is metadata at its finest form, where you have a way to quickly analyze the data, put them into a database in a scalable way, um, and also share and publish the metadata. Right? So this is one of our best, uh, most proud technology we want to show you in our, in our booth. And then bring your favorite genes or mutations. We can even annotate um, all the most commonly annotated NCBI database, uh, Cosmic, uh, clean bar, so we can show you even if this mutation has an active clinical trial going on, right? So this is a, a very cool technology that uh, we want to show you. Uh, and finally, uh, we're also working on imaging, so this is some early results. Uh, but even before we get there, we work with UPMC uh, to consolidate their packs into VNA. So this is one of our uh, uh, early uh, example of consolidating the storage and also saving costs as well, right? Uh, we also work with MD Anderson on de-identifying the medical image data. Uh, so if you think about DICOM data, um, it has 3,000 headers. So how do you know which DICOM file is completely de-identified? Right? So we use MetaOcean technology to make sure the image coming from the PACS can be fully de-identified before you move into the research computing for an analysis. And finally, um, we're going to do a, uh, on Thursday here, uh, we're going to showcase probably the first, maybe the first three uh, deep learning use case in medical imaging. We're going to show you how we're going to use uh, deep learning to identify um, cancer cells in a pathology slide. That's the first one. Second one, we're going to show you how we're going to use AI to, to detect, um, um, actually to, to denoise ECG data um, from, uh, from a, a, a real patients. And thirdly, we're going to show you how we're going to use the same technology to um, to transform a, a under-sampled uh, MR data, um, uh, MRI data, right? So these are the first three different use cases using the same architecture and technology behind it. Um, and one of them is actually going to be running in our booths, right? So we're moving to very aggressively into the deep learning. But before you even get there, you have to get your data organized, right? You need to get the blue layer and the gray layer in place so you don't have to you know, scramble for data and scramble for metadata and information because you need all these right, to do deep learning, like uh, Eric uh, Schmidt talked about yesterday. Um, so, and on the last one, we also have, um, we're addressing the cloud issue aggressively. So um, when we build this architecture, because we own and we can innovate on these layers, the green and the blue layer, now we can say, we, just, we don't have to just run this in one place, right? We can actually put the green and blue in a cloud. Uh, so we already done that with some public cloud, including IBM public cloud. Um, so this is where we want to get to. So think of the green and blue now gives you this ability to orchestrate data wherever they go, right? So you can be on any one of these research or hospital sites, um, and there's a public cloud here. So you can submit job, run your deep learning, store your data, any one of these three sites, right? It can be processed on-premise, or it can be uh, um, burst into the cloud. But in front of you, it will be still the same screen when you can run single button click, run your pipeline, imaging, genomics, clinical, deep learning, and get your data. It's all in front of you. But on the back end, you probably don't know, or you probably shouldn't even care where the data is going, right? Because it's managed and orchestrated by these two layers. So that's my last chart.
And uh, Doug, you want to say a few words about not just in healthcare industry, but also in across the entire you know, high performance computing, other industry, sure. the trend. Yeah. So could you go back to your uh, yeah. architecture slide? Sure. So folks, um, the, the solutions that uh, Frank's been talking about here that are the, you know, the software engine underneath all of this, they span from automotive to Wall Street, and uh, all those clients, including yourselves, have a similar problem. Do more with less, right? Everybody is challenged with doing more with less, driving efficiency, and that's whether you're using on-premise resources in the cloud, it's all about intelligent orchestration of compute resources driving up efficiency, and that's key right here in the middle, right? And then also they're being inundated with massive amounts of data. And it, it, everyone's facing the same problems. These solutions are built on years of innovation in IBM and with acquisition, dating back to platform computing and uh, our parallel file system with GPFS now called Spectrum Scale. Mm -hmm. So hardened, high performance computing resources and, and uh, assets that have been transforming you know, everything from national labs now into Wall Street and again, life sciences alike. Mm -hmm. So very critical differentiation, and yeah. um, the, the combination of the two is what's really fusing the ability to drive these types of architectures yeah. and use cases. Yeah. Anything else, Frank? Yeah. No. Maybe questions, we'll maybe? Take questions, and, and then again, bring your problem to us. Challenge us. I mean, we, I just met two uh, gentlemen I mean, coming to us and say, I have this ECG data. You know, can you help us build some platform to analyze it, store it, right? And eventually de de develop deep learning because our competitor is knocking on the door. They're developing their, you know, smart app that can analyze ECG data. So, you know, let, let us work with you, help you, right? Build the platform that can gain you advantage in this horse race, right? With data called and AI. Okay. Yeah, question here. Thank you much for your presentation. Thanks. I have some question. Okay. Uh, when you analyze the genomic data, do you also integrate the clinical data as well? Absolutely, yeah. So the, the database I show you, we can mm -hmm. uh, integrate at the database level. We can also integrate at the workflow level. Okay, including the unstruct unstructured data in the uh, doctor's notes? Yes, or? yes, okay. absolutely. So, we, mm -hmm. so you can think of that as another pillar here, mm -hmm. right? So the clinical data comes in as structured, unstructured doctor notes. Mm -hmm. So we, we have to structure them just like we structure the genomic data. So in here, we have different technology for natural language processing. Mm -hmm. So IBM Watson has lots of APIs mm -hmm. for speech to text and okay. then for natural language processing. Mm -hmm. Plug them in here, like different Watson technology to, to structure your data. Once you organize the data, then we can link them together, mm -hmm. right, with the genomic data and imaging data. Okay. So we're already building probably the first platform that can converge all these data in one, again, easy, right, one screen. You can see all of them. Okay, thank you yeah, so much. Sure. Okay, so welcome to stop by our booth at uh, Boost 11, just right down the corner. And, uh, uh, you know, stop us and, you know, thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Thanks, Doug.